For 16 years, from 1989 through 2004, Book Notes was C-SPAN's signature author interview program. Focusing exclusively on contemporary nonfiction, the Book Notes series created an unparalleled television forum for writers of history, biography, politics, and public and cultural affairs. The Book Notes format was simple. One author, one book, one hour. For a full hour every Sunday night, 52 weeks a year, nonfiction writers were asked to discuss their most recent work. Beyond the book subject matter, authors were also queried about their research, their writing process, and their own lives and influences. The result is a body of televised interviews that serve as a lasting scholarly resource for authors, researchers, students, readers, and educators. George Mason University Libraries is now adding to this trove of information by re-interviewing selected authors about their experiences as part of the Book Notes series. Good morning. Today is Wednesday, May 21st, 2014, and we are interviewing author Andrew Ferguson, who appeared on Book Notes on November 3rd, 1996, to discuss his book, Fool's Names, Fool's Faces. My name is Misha Griffith, and Bob Vey is behind the camera. Good morning, Mr. Ferguson. Good morning. Thank you for, for having us to your Very office. Very happy to do it. So how did you come to be on Book Notes? Uh, well, I had a, a long history with C-SPAN and uh, Brian by then. Uh, I think I was first on in 1985. I had been with a magazine called The American Spectator that had been out in Bloomington, Indiana and had moved to Washington or to Arlington, Virginia. and. Uh, I guess Brian had read the magazine for many years because he's also a Hoosier. Mm -hmm. And um, so they spent a week over at our offices doing um, uh, interviews with everybody. And I think they filmed an editorial meeting or something. I can't really remember. And uh, it was m the first time I was ever on television. It was a round table in our conference room with um, another guy, Bill Tucker, and uh, the uh, sort of right-wing rich guy journalist Taki and me and uh, I was just thinking the other night it was so long ago that I could actually smoke on camera that's how ancient it seems now um, but anyway so uh, Brian and I uh, con continued to have sort of a uh, friendship and I was on several times yeah. on his regular call-in show and then uh, I guess uh, he just happened to see the book when the book came out. Uh, their stack of books that they would get there. And uh, he, he decided he wanted to do it. And uh, somebody called me and said, can you do this? It wasn't him. But. <laughs> and did you, how did you prepare for your appearance? I read the book again because <laughs> I'd, already, I'd already forgotten most of what was in it. Um, and uh, let's see, I guess my wife helped me pick out a tie. I used to wear bow ties all the time back then because um, I wanted to look nice. We were, um, it, was, it was interesting because, I mean, I watched book notes every night, and I mean every Sunday, um, as many of my friends did. And it was a big thing in Washington. Uh, and f for publicity for that book, I did lots of things, like I did Good Morning America and other shows and uh, the publicist was by far more much more excited uh, that I was going to be on book notes than I would Good Morning America I, which she arranged I think I assume she arranged to get on Good Morning America but the book notes thing came through back channels sort of uh, but as she explained you know Good Morning America you'll reach 12 million people and 40 of them buy books, you know. Whereas book notes, you'll, you'll reach 500,000 people and all of them buy books. So which is a better deal? So, um, so they were very excited that I was going to be on book notes. Uh, what do you remember most about your appearance on the program? And things like the studio and what was the atmosphere like in the building? You know, I don't remember that well. I, I, I believe it was done on the first floor of that... Uh, 400 North Capitol building, because uh, they, they used to have a, a, uh, a studio on the first floor and then they had stuff up on the, f whatever it is, fourth or fifth floor. Um, and so it was a closed in studio, I remember that, and uh, um, I don't know, it was, it was a very relaxed time. That was always such a great thing about being on C-SPAN 
was it was just, especially if it was Brian, it was just extremely, um, it was like you were sitting in a living room talking to your friend, you know, it really wasn't. Uh, it, it didn't burnish itself in my memory for that, really. All right. So book notes, hour-long format, differed greatly from most of the network television interviews, which lasted three minutes or less. You mentioned your Absolutely. Good Morning America appearance. So what do you think uh, are the benefits or drawbacks of this longer format for the author and for the viewer? Uh, well, for the viewer, I think it could probably be rough sledding uh, because, you know, a lot of authors have this sort of uh, logoria, they just, words just pour out of them and, and they won't stop talking, which I think can be kind of painful for the viewer sometimes. But, uh, but of course, I mean, from my perspective, it, it, you actually can explain what you mean. You know, you don't have to crunch everything down into pithy lines. As you do when, you, when you're promoting a book, you, you furnish your mind with eight or 10 or 12 sentences that you just repeat over and over again that are supposed to give somebody an idea of what the book is. And uh, you don't have to worry about that with C-SPAN. And uh, so that, that's an enormous advantage for a writer. that You get to explain yourself. And for people who are watching, um, assuming that I do, that they're all book people, they all love books or they wouldn't be watching the show, um, you know, they get to see see who who those strange people are who put all those words on the page, you know, and that's, um, so I, I loved it as, as just as a writer and um, as a viewer too. So judging from the extensive marginalia in his books, it appears that Mr. Lamb read them thoroughly before the interview. Do you find this to be normal with interviewers? And how does it change the interview experience? Um, well, it's definitely not normal, as I'm sure everybody will tell you uh, who's, who's done those kinds of things. Uh, it's very rare to find somebody who's uh, read the book. You can, um, even on NPR, where, you know, which is sort of more of a bookish world, you'd think, um, it's, it's, in my experience, very rare that the, that the people will have read the book. Um, I remember one local NPR show I did once when I was, um, I had written a book about Abraham Lincoln, which Brian Lamb actually kind of helped me with. And uh, it was supposed to be semi-humorous sort of thing. And, and we were on this big call-in show in, I think it was Pittsburgh. Uh, big deal, you know, because I was going to be doing a reading that night and it was really going to get out all the, all the um, publicity. And uh, so we're just about to go on the air and she's, the, the lady has her headphones down around her neck and she says, oh, by the way, uh, you know, you've got to talk to your publicist because your publicist is selling this book as though it's really funny. And you know what? It's not. It's not funny at all. Okay, we're on. And then <laughs> she puts on it and I'm like, what? <laughs> and um, so even when, so she had read the book, but that wasn't any help at all because she hated it. So uh, in some instances, it's better that you just you know, that they haven't read the book. But Brian had read the book and um, had appreciated it. I mean, I think that was one thing that I've talked to other people who were on it, is he always gave you the sense that he liked the book, even if, um, even if he didn't. And I'm sure there were a lot that he didn't. Uh, sometimes I would think, my God, because I know he read every page of every book, but I thought, how on earth did you <laughs> manage to finish that awful dog of a book? But... Um, but anyway, even if he never betrayed his feelings in that way. So the writer was on and felt more comfortable because you figure here's a guy who understands the book, who's read it, and likes it. You know, more, most important of all, he liked my book. So, Do you see the, the, the Book Notes interview as being something of an intermediary between just the, the elevator pitch that you mm -hmm. have to give on, on the typical show and an actual printed review? of mm. someone who carefully read the book you hope mm -hmm. and will hopefully give it a fair shake. Yeah, that's an interesting um, point. Of course, with, with Brian, his, his great gift has always been to be sort of transparent. I mean, he, he, is, he is America's guy in Washington, you know, and, and all he, he's trying to do, is because he's famously self-effacing, um, is he's trying to become the window pane through which you can show yourself uh, to the audience. 
in one hopes to readers. Um, and so in that sense, he's an intermediary, uh, and he's, but he's not, he's not a reviewer. Um, you know, he's not critiquing books. Um, so that's also a relief, I think, to any writer to know that not only does he like the book, he's not going to tell me if he doesn't. You know, <laughs> sort of. Hmm. So uh, Mr. Lamb asked about an author's research and writing methods. Do you believe the reading public finds these, these tales about the practice of writing interesting? And do you think authors and other publishers find them interesting as well? Well, I think uh, writers all, all find stories like that very interesting, find out, you know, sort of shop talk. Um, you know, what time of day do you write? How many words a day do you feel like you have to do? Um, I'm sure readers, especially viewers of book notes, uh, who are book people, um, I'm sure are very curious as to how books actually get put together and how the words appear on the page. Uh, publishers, no, I don't think publishers care. George Will once told me that uh, the, the columnist um, said, I think I had just started publishing. Maybe it was when this book came out. And he'd said, uh, you know, I have to tell you the secret about publishers. And if you know this, everything else will fall into place. Publishers hate books. And uh, aha, you know, the little light bulb went on. And I realized, yes. You know, that explains a lot of the, my relationship with the publisher. Um, so uh, I've been lucky, actually, in my, in my editors and publishers, but uh, publishers are not, they're, they're marketers more than anything else, and so they're tradesmen in that way, and I don't think they care that much about the inside baseball. Fascinating. Mr. Lamb frequently asked guests biographical questions. You know, usually in those short staccato, kids, ages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, did that surprise you, and is this generally different from most author interviews you experienced? Oh, uh, no, it didn't surprise me because I knew him and I, I knew his methods and I'd seen the show. Um, uh, but, yeah, it is, it is different from other, I mean, it's an, it is another way in which the Book Notes experience was different from any other book promotion. Um, because in between all these sort of very substantial and interesting questions he'd be asking you about the, the meat of the book, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, your kids, okay, so now I have to switch track and I have to think about my kids. What are their names again? You know, and, so, and then, um, and then all of a sudden it's back to some deep question about the book. And I, I've always wondered whether he did that kind of uh, strategically. I mean, whether he, was, he would mix those questions up as a way of keeping the writer from falling into formulaic answers and stuff. So that he could guarantee that he was going to get something fresh by uh, alternating, you know, tell us about cosmology to, you know, what's your dog's name kind of thing. He'd, and he just switching back and forth like that was very, um, it certainly worked. I don't know if he did it strategically or not. Were there any of the questions he asked that surprised you? Yeah, I, I'll never forget one. Is he said, um, he said, Andrew Ferguson, why do you do what you do? <laughs> and I was like, you know, it's the kind of question you don't really want to ask yourself. Um, and uh, so I told him, well, you know, it happens at my, every two weeks in the mail I get this little envelope that has a little rectangular piece of paper on it and it has numbers and, and um, that's pretty much why I do it, which is true. Um, but I, I, it took me a while to think, you know, it was, well, you then it was went a good question. A description of the writing process and how Oh, did I? I don't quite remember how. Yeah, oh, is that what? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I remember that I went on a song and, you know. Yeah, it was heartening for those of us who are in, in the middle of our dissertation process. Oh, good. Okay. good, good. Uh, did you watch book notes before? Well, we established yes, you watched absolutely. it before. Uh, did your experience on the show change your perspective on it? Uh, no, no, because, you know, as I said, I'd been watching it before, and I knew Ryan uh, outside of book notes because I'd been on these other shows of his. Um, so, no, it didn't really change anything. I was extremely flattered to be asked, and, uh, you know, no matter what 
anyone tells you about their false modesty, uh, uh, everybody likes being able to go on for an hour talking about himself. That's just, people like that. People get, and they, you don't often get a chance to do it. At least not with my wife, you can't do it. She won't <laughs> let me. But. The Book Notes series focused entirely on nonfiction books published between the late 1980s and 2004. What do you think might be the advantages of an uh, 800 book collection of these selections? Wow. Well, I, I, I just would think it'd be invaluable. I'm so happy to hear that this is going on. Um, I'm sure this is kind of a cliche, but it's really sort of a portrait of intellectual life uh, among the academic and political class. And uh, I can't imagine that um, anybody could dip into it without getting a sense of how the world was changing and, and what the what the intellectual currents were. I mean, he, he really had a great, I, I, I never discerned the principle that he used in picking what books, um, but uh, the, picking the books he did, but I was, it, you, well, you know, I mean, they were all over the lot, totally unpredictable, but always sort of reflective of something that was going on beyond the book itself. I mean, I don't think he would, he, he didn't have, a, in the 90s, for example, um, there were a ton of books. Uh, memoirs became very big, mm -hmm. usually written, Barack Obama's first book is a classic example of it, usually written by people who haven't lived long enough to have an interesting life. But, you know, they were very anguished, and they were nonfiction books, and I don't think he ever fell for that trendy kind of thing. But, um, but he did have memoirists on, obviously. Uh, but people who had lived substantial lives. So you always got something far beyond just the mere author's experience. You were seeing some kind of larger, uh, he was giving you a window into a larger world by talking about the book. And if you put all that together, I, can, I just think it would be an amazing collage of. Well, even with, with your book as a collection of essays that you had written since, mm -hmm. I think, 1984, yeah. you can see that sweep happening the, those yeah, yeah, changes yeah. that are slowly happening, and uh, your, you know, your book is interesting in the way that you you actually reflect on yeah, yeah, on how these changes are occurring with the with the administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that never stops, of course. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked at that book in so long. I imagine it looks horribly dated, but um, but you know that's journalism for you. Yeah. It's, it's very explanatory of of the politics of the time. Hmm. Well, it's a helpful window. Oh, that's good to hear. In, into understanding, you know, if you're looking at it from just uh, the, the position of what the bare bones journalism is happening or what the scholars are writing about, mm -hmm. it has a particular niche. Yeah. Okay. You know, one thing that always helped me, my, my fondness for it, his, his obsessions were kind of my obsessions in a way. I mean, I, I say he didn't understand the principle by which he picked books. But, and it's also kind of a Midwestern thing, maybe. Um, I'm from Illinois, my wife is from Indiana, and Brian, of course, is from Indiana. And um, his, his love of history uh, was uh, sort of a theme that tied the whole show together, because I think probably if you looked at it, I'm sure there were more history books than anything else. I don't know, you probably made a count. But, um, but I really appreciated that because, uh, because I'd grown up around people who loved history, and I loved history, and I wanted my children to grow up loving history. Uh, my wife loves history. Uh, and I, I really, um, I don't know, I really uh, felt compatible with him in that way, that he, he was um, so deeply interested in the country's past. And Brian Lamb and C-SPAN had a rule that authors could only appear on the program one time. You, in fact, came late, were there before and thereafter. Mm -hmm. um, if asked, would you appear on the show again? Oh, in a heartbeat, <laughs> in a heartbeat. No, it's such a privilege to be able to sit down with him. I mean, people have said that, I mean, he really is the greatest interviewer I've ever seen. And, you know, they're great interviewers. Um, uh, you know, Diane Rehm is a very good interviewer. And, uh, but he's absolutely the best. Partly it's because of this transparency thing I was talking about. It, it's just, 
Diane Rehm has a very big personality. Charlie Rose, who's also a good interviewer, has a very big personality. Uh, Brian uh, does not let whatever personality he has become an issue in any conversation. And, um, you know, the fact that he has these out of left field questions, you know, like, well, why do you do what you do, or kids, or, you know, um, makes him just, just really the best there ever was, I think. Uh, was there a difference in sales or national attention for your books after you discussed it with Brian Lamb on book notes? Yeah, actually, the, uh, I mean, the, the book didn't sell worth beans, but, um, but it was because so many people in Washington, in New York publishing, watched book notes. It, I mean, I, I became better. I think being on book notes was more important to me than, or to, you know, any kind of public figure I have than actually publishing the book. You know, I was sort of the guy who got to go on book notes to promote whatever the book was. And because um, you just reached people who were very important in the journalism world then. Did your experience with Brian Lamb and book notes cause you to rethink any of your own approaches or assumptions regarding your research or writing? Hmm. No, I don't think so. Uh, although the next book I did, which was quite a while later, um, and wasn't a collection, but was a through book written book about Abraham Lincoln, Brian was enormously helpful in that, in my research, because he's sort of a Lincoln buff, although he says he's not. He is a Lincoln buff. And um, because of the, the wonderful things he'd done with C-SPAN, you know, I, you know he, they did the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and, and uh, he had had this series where they followed uh, Tocqueville's journey through America, and so just absolutely unique and wonderful television. Um, he knew a lot about people out in the heartland who were interested in history. And so when I told him that I wanted to do this book, he immediately gave me three or four leads that ended up being in the book. I mean, ended up probably being half the book. And uh, so, I mean, he, that's the influence he's had on my research, I guess, but it wasn't through being on, on book notes. Uh, what have you been working on after this book? We mentioned the Lincoln book. And which works are you most pleased with? Oh, boy. I don't know. I'm not really particularly pleased <laughs> with them. I wish, you know, I, I look back and I think I wish I'd done it better and, or I'd had more time or uh, actually I tell myself I wish I'd had more time, but I don't think more time would have helped. There's a great quote from Karl Krauss, the, the German philosopher and writer, who said, a journalist is somebody who, if you give him more time, writes worse. And I think that that's kind of probably true of me being a journalist rather than a historian or academic. So it doesn't. But then again, it's your, your bread and butter is a, is a more of a daily column. Were you? Yeah, well, I'm, magazine articles yeah. really you is magazine what Magazine articles. Yeah, I was a columnist, yeah. a weekly columnist for a while, but I stopped that. Yeah, that's got to drain off. It does, it really does. Oh, in another way though, it kind of replenishes it, because you, you have to keep your mind working all the time. I know a lot of people who, who write columns simply so they can, it helps them write books because, because you, you, the mind never stops. So, so it's always kind of in gear and well oiled. In your estimation, what has been the lasting impact of book notes uh, on the American society? Well, I'm sure it's not enough. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure that they're everywhere you would go. There were people who remember reading book notes and who found a book um, that they wouldn't have found otherwise, or it in inflamed their love of reading, or of the intellectual life, or the life of the mind. Um, and I imagine that the, I don't see any great sweeping cultural effect, but I'm sure the effect is very real through individual human beings who got touched by it. Is there anything that you would like to add regarding book notes or C-SPAN or Brian Lamb? Uh, you know, I think I did write something down that I wanted to make sure okay. I uh, got through. Oh, I did, yeah, I, I think I wanted to say one thing that made him so unique in, in Washington um, was 
Uh, I kind of have suspicions about what Brian's personal politics are, but I don't know. And he certainly never said, uh, explained them to me. But the fact that he seemed so non-ideological, and in a time that was becoming where we have what we have now, which is this hideously over-politicized, over-ideologized atmosphere in Washington, uh, which was just coming to fruition, I think, when, when he was starting off in book notes in the 90s, um, the fact that he was non-ideological and that his only lodestar was his curiosity, which seemed to be endless, you know, I mean, he could be interested in anything, um, gave him a stature here that is really hard to um, describe. And I, I don't know anybody who doesn't like him. I would love to know if, if, at the end of your project if there's anybody who says something bad about him because he's so um, admirable in so many ways and partly because he rose above this awful idea, ideologized world that he was covering. And, um, and Book Notes was a perfect example. You know, left wingers and right wingers and moderates and apolitical people and you never could tell what his own politics were. It's a wonderful, very rare thing. The rarest thing in Washington, I think. <laughs> Well, Mr. Ferguson, thank you for agreeing to do this oral history interview and for sharing with us your experiences on this groundbreaking television interview program. I'm very, very, very uh, grateful to you for well, having the chance. So thank you.